wines, how to choose a wine, look at a wine menu, and things along those lines. Uh, so let's give him our undivided attention, and we'll have a, a nice learning lesson in reference to how to appreciate wine, how to order wine, and go from there. Corey, you're up. All right, everyone. So I just want to talk a little bit about my background, so you can just kind of see how someone can get involved in the wine world, because I know that's a question I get asked a lot, how did I fall into this business? Um, I started out as a server back in 2006. Um, didn't really know much about anything in regards to the restaurant industry, just, you know, get my feet wet. Uh, I actually moved then to Arizona, uh, Phoenix, and actually fell into a serving job at a wine bar and cafe. That's where I was introduced to wine. Um, it really opened my eyes. I, I caught the wine bug, it's called, basically. Um, through that, I took a lot of beginning classes. Uh, I just read a lot. You know, reading the back of bottles, believe it or not, actually adds up a lot of knowledge. Uh, getting familiar with labels. Um, at that point, then, I moved back to New York and I got a job at a wine retail shop for two years. Uh, that was extremely important in developing my foundation as far as wine knowledge. Uh, I was lucky to work with uh, three gentlemen that had been in the industry in some capacity for decades, and they were great resources for me. Um, they actually encouraged me then to go to school, so I went uh, in Manhattan to the uh, International Wine Center through the London Spirit and Wine Trust. So I did that um, for about uh, six months. Passed that with distinction. Oh, that's cool. Um, <laughs> and, uh, at that point, I got a job at Prime serving. Um, and that's how I got introduced to the Bolson Restaurant Group. Uh, that was back in 2009. Um, at that point, I met the corporate beverage director, Paulo Valela, and I basically told him from the get-go what my intentions were, which was to uh, involve myself and immerse myself in the world of wine, and just basically through osmosis and anything that needs to get done, I'm there. Um, so, you know, it's okay, whatever, fine. Uh, but uh, long story told short, uh, now I'm here. Uh, I was made assistant to him at Prime back in 2010, I think. Then I was brought to Monsoon. I helped open that and ran the beverage program there for the first six months. Uh, then I was brought back to Prime to manage for a summer. Uh, then I was brought here uh, about two years ago to run the wine program here. Uh, so I've been here since 2012. And I'll be here uh, until further notes. <laughs> um, another great benefit I got to do with being involved with Bolson Restaurant Group and just being involved with wine was I got to go to Italy. I got to work on a harvest in northeastern Italy in Lombardia, an area called Valtellina. Uh, I got to work with Nino Negri Winery and harvest Chiavinesca, which is basically an offshoot of uh, Nebbiolo, which is in Barolo, Barbaresco, wines like that. Um, that was a phenomenal, eye-opening experience that presented me with knowledge and you know, experiences that I'll carry forever. Uh, but enough about me, let's talk about wine. I know a lot of people with wine think that there's a whole lot of, not mystery, but maybe, not even science, but just games maybe. It's really not the case. Um, any good sommelier will be an open book and very transparent as far as what they do and why they do it. So feel free to always ask questions. Um, the more you know, the more you're comfortable with drinking wine, the better off I am. And that's my philosophy. I want you to ask questions. I want you to feel comfortable with drinking wine. I want you to feel comfortable with ordering wine. I want you to try things, you know? I, you know, I say this example to everyone. They always ask me, what my favorite wine is? That's so hard for me to answer. I drink based on my mood. Sometimes I feel a certain way and I want to drink a certain thing. I mean, Italy has a thousand different grapes alone. It's one country that does not even take into account blending. So for me to drink the same wine all the time, I almost find that to be criminal in a sense. But people are creatures of habit, so my job is to get you to break those habits. So that's what I did. So what I want to go over real fast is how to open a bottle of wine. Now I know there's a lot of products out there with the rabbit and pumps and things. I use this. This is all I will ever use. My girlfriend makes fun of me, everyone makes fun of me, because there's all, you know, I'll, even at the restaurant, you know, that's a problem, I carry this almost everywhere I go. Call me an alcoholic, but whatever. <laughs> all you need to do, basically, is cut the front and cut the back of the neck, and then you can either pop it off, or, depending on how you cut it, you can just pop it off with your hand. Let's put that away. What I like to do is put my finger on the side, sort of like a spine, Come in at 45 degrees, and then it should be perpendicular in the middle. You're going to twirl it down until about the last curly cue is a little up. 
Okay? Now, it's not about strength, it's about leverage. You're, it's, this is a machine, you're supposed to let it do the work for you. This is a double hinge. The reason is because you see how it's got one hinge here, and another one here. I'm going to use both of them, again, using leverage. So, first one, second one. So now this is ready to pop. What a lot of people do is literally pop the bottom. That's actually a mistake, believe it or not. What you want to do is gently almost burp it like a Tupperware. The reason being is that wine is starving for air, okay? Think of it like a starving person. Would you give a lot of food to a starving person? You wouldn't. That would kill them. You have to slowly acclimate them. It's the same thing with wine. You could actually bruise the wine if you pop it. So I just want to take it off. That's all it is. Now, I want to debunk another myth. Presenting the cork. There's actually zero reason to present the cork. I'm sorry, is there a reason to present the cork? There was no reason to present the cork. A lot of people think it is indicative of the quality of the wine. Sometimes it can be, but not for the reason most people believe that to be. A cork smells like cork. It's supposed to. The wine's what you're supposed to smell. Back during merchant times, a lot of wine would be bottled and sold as something else. What proprietors did was then they started to put their own corks in wines and label it. And that's why you would see designs in certain corks. So if you were opening a bottle of wine, you were inspecting the cork to make sure that it was not tampered with. And it was the original cork to the bottle you just purchased. That's the only reason anyone ever presented a cork. So we had wine poured everywhere. I don't know if some people drank their wine already or <laughs> might have already. But basically what I wanted to go over was just how to taste wine and what you're tasting for when you're ordering wine at a restaurant. Before you do that, yes. as far as the difference with the cork and the screw cap, is there any difference as far as the Yes, it's a good question. Um, there's three types of things. There, well, four, really. There's cork, there's synthetic cork, which is like the rubbery thing, there's screw cap, and there's stelvin. Stelvin and screw cap kind of get confused a little bit. Screw cap is when there's just a screw cap on top. Stelvin is when there's the other piece on the bottom as well that can connect. Stelvin is airtight. Stelvin technically is the best way to keep your wine sealed from air, because it's the only thing that's 100% closed. Cork is porous. Cork allows your wine to age gracefully over time, because air gets in very, very slow. Um, as far as quality of a wine, it really just depends on if it's a wine that's age-worthy. You wouldn't put a wine that you're going to sit down for about 10 years or 15 years in a Stelvin or a cork, because there's no air getting in, so it cannot age. Whereas if you had a wine that was going to be drank within a year, you know, some whites, even some reds, you know, you can put it in a Stelvin, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It doesn't mean the wine's any uh, lesser, and most wineries are going that way because it almost ensures that you're not going to lose any product. You know, you, you hear about corked wine, that's something we go over while we're tasting. Um, about one in 10 bottles does get corked. Uh, so it is a real thing, but that's not the only thing that can happen to a wine. So, when a psalm or waiter or server or anyone pours a glass of wine, they're going to pour about an ounce to an ounce and a half in their glass, okay? So what you're doing then is letting air get into the wine. So you're supposed to twirl. So there is actually a reason why. What's happening is the phenolics in the wine is actually expressing itself. So the bouquet, which is the smell, is starting to awaken. So what you're doing is smelling to see for three things. One, if it's oxidized, which means overexposure to air. Usually smells kind of metallic then, uh, almost like pennies, and it'll taste that way too. That's a sign that the bottle was exposed to too much air. Whether or not the cork wasn't sealed, there was a leak, whatever, it doesn't matter. There's a flow in the bottle. And any good restaurant will take the bottle back if there's a flow. Uh, another thing that can happen is matterization, exposure to heat. Um, that could happen with improper storage. That could have happened whether the wine was transported improperly, stored improperly at the restaurant, stored improperly at the warehouse. I mean, it, there's who knows, but the point is, it was exposed to heat at some point, and again, you get sort of a metallic copper kind of flavoring uh, that is very unpleasant. The third thing is corks. Uh, what that means is not technically that the cork is bad. What happens is the actual bacteria grows on the cork and produces a, uh, a waste that affects the wine, which makes it almost vinegary, like gym socks, just very unpleasant. Uh, you'll know when it happens. I'm sure everyone has had it at some point happen. Um, those are the three things you're looking for when you're tasting and smelling a bottle of wine at the restaurant. It's not necessarily whether you like it or not. 
I mean, again, there are certain situations where there's exceptions to the rules. For example, if I'm talking to a guest and I specifically recommend a bottle of wine, I want you to try it and you don't like it, I'll take it back because that's on me. You know, you took a gamble and I, I respect that. And again, that goes back to me wanting you to feel comfortable buying wine and ordering wine and venturing outside the box. Um, a, a big thing about wine to me is the approach of wine, which is to say that wine is not ice cream flavors. Cabernet is not Rocky Road. Chardonnay is not vanilla. It doesn't work that way. It's all about the specifics to the winery and the area the wine comes from. It's more important where you drink as opposed to what you drink. An example I could present is like pizza places. You have two pizza places next to each other, right? They all consist of sauce, cheese, and dough. Do they taste the same? Not at all. Why? Same ingredients. That's how you have to think of wine. So a Cabernet is not a Cabernet is not a Cabernet. A Cabernet from South America, totally different than a Cabernet from Northern California. Totally different than a Cabernet from Veneto. That's why it's very important to look into where you're drinking, look into the laws in regards to what can be grown there. Because that's another thing. There's governing bodies in Europe that decide what can be grown, when it can be grown, how much of it can be grown. Um, whereas in America, that's not necessarily the case. You can go pretty much wherever you want, wherever you want, as long as you pay the taxes associated with the alcohol level. So it's a very different approach. Um, and the thing with wine is you can be as scientific with it as you want, or you can be as you know, free with it as you want. Um, that's the beauty of wine, I think. Um, so now that you're a little bit more comfortable with what you're looking for when you're ordering a bottle of wine, does anyone have any questions about wine lists in general, as far as what to look for, questions that they might have about ordering wine in a restaurant? Think to myself, how the hell do these people taste this and this and this and this? I'm like, I'm like I taste red fruit. I taste, it, I taste grapes, you know? I was there. Uh, what I did was ask people that same question. They literally just said, keep drinking. Keep drinking. What I also did though was I went around to a supermarket and just other places and I specifically tried to smell and experience flavors that I wasn't familiar with. Like different types of vegetables, different types of greens, different types of anything, fruits, so that I could sort of really specify what I was kind of getting. Uh, and also when I went to the International Wine Center, they kind of made me think in terms of digging deeper. Like, okay, I smell red fruit. What kind of red fruit do I smell? Do I smell cherries? Okay, it's cherries. Are they sour cherries? Are they wild cherries? The black cherries? You know, and, and that's really how I got to the point of realizing what I was actually experiencing. Yeah, but what about your taste? Is it it's possible physiologically that you have more refined taste buds than I do? It's possible, but that's also could be not necessarily to what I have myself, but you know, a smoker might not necessarily have the same level of taste buds that a non-smoker would have, you know, little things like that. I mean, having orange juice before, having wine, little thing, having a, a, a mint before, having a glass of wine, I mean, these things over time affect your palate. I mean, for years I keep hearing the guy, a critic, tasted the wine and he tasted oaky. I never tasted any oak in any wine that I ever But here's my thing, oak, what that means to him is not the same thing it means to you. When I hear oak, what I'm hearing that person say is they taste vanilla, they taste toast, they taste maybe a little nutmeg. These are, and it depends on the type of oak because that'll impart different flavors also. But he's tasting it. Right. I never taste it. I bet you do, you just don't know how to express what you're tasting. And that's what it comes down to. Being able to feel comfortable in knowing what specifically you're experiencing. And that just comes with time. This, you presented this as a sample wine. Mm -hmm. What should I be able to taste in this? That's a South American Cabernet, right? That's not my last question. <laughs> that's fine. Um, that's actually a Cabernet that is certainly not wimpy, but it's not going to be the most in-your-face, dry, astringent Cabernet that you've had. When I say astringent, I mean, you know, when you have chalky on the side of your mouth, it's not going to be 100% like that. The reason is because it's from South America, and it's, while it is certainly a hot area, they don't have a ton of stems and the skins that they use were not as thick. In terms of or rhubarb or whatever. I rhubarb. <laughs> If, what do you think, is there anything unusual, about a specific flavor that I should be, that I should, if, if I were sophisticated and had the physiology to taste it, what would I taste? You would taste a general flavor and the specifics to that generality would be your own, which is to say that I would taste earth, but what kind of earth I taste might be a bit different than the earth you taste. All right. And it all comes from experience. Listen, wine is a, is a sensory object. I smell a glass of wine, and that smell can bring me back to fresh cut fresh in the, uh, you know, at a barbecue somewhere. I mean, and, and that's what I got from that. 
I'm not wrong, you know? You're not wrong. Yes. Yes. All right, uh, I'll tell you. Um, that was just because of the movie. It was just like a joke. Um, what's funny about that is the last one, you know, the Cheval Blanc, the 67 Cheval Blanc that he was coveting the whole time? There's Molo in that. are done is based on where a wine comes from because it's regulated based on whether or not the government's involved. For example, in America we list wines by grapes, which is why we have the mentality that wine is like flavors and ice cream flavors. Whereas in Europe it's more about where the wine's from. So you'll see the name of the town and you might not even see a grape. You just need to know that they happen to grow this grape in this town. 